Welcome everyone to our latest webinar in the Forging a New Path series, um, which will look at crude valuation and how it's affected by uh, emissions intensity. And um, we're gonna be looking at sort of accounting for emissions, uh, uh, emissions intensity in crude oil and natural gas, what impact this could have on the price of oil and gas, and what impact it could have on investment. Um, and I'm absolutely just delighted that we have three great speakers with us today. We have John T. Rushforth from uh, S&P Global Platz. He's Senior Director of the Price Group. We have Guillaume Kivigé, Origination and Business Development for EMEA at VITOL, and Michael Coran, Head of Emissions and Tra Emissions Trading at VITOL. So for this session, we will um, we'll give each of the, uh, we'll, uh, both Guillaume will be speaking and Michael will be uh, available for the discussion after. So we'll have Jonti and then Guillaume speak. Um, and I'll take a couple of moments of, um, for points of clarification or Q&A quickly between them, but then we'll have a half hour for discussion um, after they've uh, shared their presentations. Um, I want to clarify that this meeting is uh, on the record uh, and it is being recorded and will be available on the New Producers Group website. Um, most of the participants you'll notice uh, today are from the New Producers Group, so from one of our 30 uh, emerging oil and gas producer countries, but we also have uh, people joining us from established uh, producer countries, some industry experts that are longtime contributors to the group, and as well as some industry folks uh, who are all welcome. Um, so without further ado, I want to just uh, turn it over to Jonti first, who's going to talk us through some really new thinking, or well, you've been working on this for a while now at Platts, but I think for us, it, it's, it's really emerging issues that are going to be increasingly important um, as carbon becomes priced um, and what impact this can have on crude valuation. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts, Jonti, and over to you. Thank you, Valerie. And uh, hopefully my slides are, are coming through okay to you all. Um, thanks very much, Valerie and Chatham House for, for putting this together today. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to, to talk to you all. Um, about this area. It's a topic um, that S&P has been spending a lot of time on uh, of late, uh, as Valerie mentioned. Um, I put up here the title carbon accounted commodities. There are a lot of different phrases, names uh, used in this space. You will hear people talk about low carbon crude. You will hear people talk about carbon neutral crude and LNG. Um, I, I think broadly, uh, what we are talking about is the measure and verification of emissions associated with the full life cycle of uh, commodities um, and then the subsequent valuation of that. So how does it impact the ultimate prices uh, that are paid uh, and how does that get integrated into the markets themselves? Um, it is very much a nascent area. Uh, you know, I will talk through some of the trades we have seen in this space over the last year uh, and how we expect that to play out going forward. Um, but this is not something which is, you know, already a um, huge part of every uh, crude market that is out there trading. Um, but it's something that we expect to be growing very significantly in the years ahead. Uh, in fact, we are having conversations almost every day with producers, traders, people in the market, those who are affected by it around this topic, uh, there is a significant amount of interest and it is growing. First of all is to state, well, why is that? And at least some of the um, motivation for it is coming from the fact that many producers have publicly announced and committed to uh, cuts to their emissions, uh, cuts that are across their supply chains, um, some of those are very ambitious. You can see on here probably the most ambitious is Repsol's statement for 2025, uh, but equally you can see Equinor and Eni aiming for a 100% uh, reduction target by 2030. Um, and a lot of these are uh, progressing as well. Um, some of them have more meat on them than others, um, but 
all of these targets are going to have to involve carbon accounting of supply chains for oil, uh, for gas, for LNG. And of course, we are all um, eagerly awaiting uh, the publication from the European Union uh, of its carbon border adjustment mechanism proposals, uh, which come out in the middle of next month. Um, I think uh, it's been sort of well publicized some of the, the um, expectations around that. The coverage is not focused on oil, it's focused on cement, uh, metals and power. Uh, and apologies, I am working from home. In the background, you will be hearing the doorbell going and I'm ignoring it though. Um, and uh, that means that we are starting to see regulatory force around this whole concept starting to come through. Uh, that's from 2023 for the, well, if they move ahead as they are, seem to be proposing for the European Union. Um, but it's certainly an area where we see uh, a lot of other governments around the world focusing as well. So if we start to think about the uh, measure of carbon intensity for a commodity, there are different ways that that measure could become incorporated into the market itself. Um, and I want to start with just talking through those. We, we see three possible approaches coming through. And for waterborne commodities, it's really the first two uh, that we've outlined here. One is that carbon intensity becomes an attribute of a commodity, much like sulfur, that a given crude uh, would have a uh, carbon intensity baseline that is known for that stream, uh, that a given particular cargo would be measured and verified and audited for its carbon intensity. Um, and buyers would there be, thereby be differentiating between different supplies on the basis of carbon intensity, as well as the other factors that are important within the crude market. That differentiation would then in effect lead to an impact on the outright value of that commodity uh, without any other instrumentation attached to it. The alternative approach, and actually the one that we have seen uh, in the market most prevalently over the last year, albeit um, in a, just a few examples, is when the associated emissions have been offset through the use of carbon credits. In fact, if you look at the details uh, for the potential carbon border adjustment mechanism coming out of the EU, um, they describe a particular instrument uh, that would be created uh, for um, paying for the associated uh, emissions and that it would be linked into uh, the quarterly auction of uh, European um, EUAs. Um, but they also talk about that being uh, accounted against um, carbon instruments from the producing nation. So there's a lot there to be unpacked. What we've seen in the market so far is companies attaching credits to particular trades. And this raises a lot of questions around what credits are being used uh, and the need for standards around what is considered the credible offsetting approach, how that is done. Now, I mentioned there are three approaches uh, that we're sort of seeing in this space. And the third is one that we um, expect to come through in North American natural gas very soon. And that um, is worth calling out here because it's, it's something that we may see elsewhere. And it's potentially also something that could come through into the waterborne market. And that's where you have a, um, what is sometimes described as a performance certificate. Uh, when of course you're injecting gas supply into the grid, uh, you no longer have the traceability of a particular uh, parcel uh, because it all gets mixed in together. So instead this approach is whereby at that point of injection, um, performance certificates are generated depending on what is proven around upstream emissions. Um, this is uh, similar um, to what you see in, for example, the North American uh, RINs instruments, uh, which are used within transportation fuels, uh, where you sort of detach 
the environmental impact um, instrument from the commodity trade and then that gets reincorporated into um, purchasing um, further down the chain. Um, oh, here we go. So I mentioned that we have seen several trades over the last year um, in this space. These are some of the ones um, that we have uh, ourselves tracked. Um, most of these on the screen uh, in front of you are actually LNG trades, um, all those ones in sort of the dark pink. Uh, there have been two particularly notable crude trades, one where Occidental sold to Reliance uh, in January, uh, and another one where um, in April where London sold um, to Saras. There's also been a couple of other commodities in there, naphtha and condensate. You will also see on here, some of these are marked uh, with the black bar around them. And that's the trades in which the what's been described as the full life cycle of associated emissions have been offset through carbon credits. In the other examples, in fact, what you've seen is either just the upstream associated emissions offset, uh, or in some of them, um, up to the point of delivery. Now that is going to become a key part of the definitions in this space. Uh, the question over exactly what part of the chain is being included when you talk about the carbon accounting uh, and what is being offset. There are different ways of defining it. Uh, and of course, that's going to um, have a very different impact in the volume of emissions. So this is the DOE's, uh, we call it relatively rough, analysis of the emissions associated with different parts of the life cycle of crude oil. And around 20% of the associated emissions are upstream of final combustion. You can see here marked out 10% at the production stage, just 1% at the transport, quite a chunk at the refining stage. And then of course, a large amount at final combustion. What we have typically seen, and if you think of the carbon border adjustment model is a focus particularly on that left hand side and that's also where you see a significant amount of the variability uh, the emissions associated with final burn are well known uh, they are essentially a question of chemistry whereas the emissions associated with the upstream uh, are a bit more complicated which i'm going to dig into in a little bit as well Suffice to say that the variability on that production and processing portion is very large. We've seen ranges of anything from, well, 10 kilograms per barrel all the way up to 300 kilograms per barrel, which is a large amount of variation. And if it becomes incorporated into how these things are valued, that is gonna obviously have a particular impact on flows. I've mentioned LNG and I will come back to it. Uh, I will be focusing more on crude oil today, but just to, to sort of um, draw out the fact that, of, of course, it's a bit more complicated in some ways when you look at LNG because you've got pr production, you've got transportation, but you also have liquefaction and regasification. Um, and those are significant because you do see a certain amount of uh, methane slippage around that. Um, as a result, um, all of those elements have to be incorporated into any analysis of associated emissions. And these things can radically change how a given fuel looks from the perspective of um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. To give you a sense of that, this is um, some calculations from our analytics team comparing LNG pipeline gas and coal into China. Uh, and as we go through each of these stages, if you start with production and extraction, um, and of course the LNG coming from outside, and I believe this is um, on the basis of uh, the Middle East. Um, so we have um, a certain amount associated at that point, you add on gathering and processing, um, and there's quite a lot more on the LNG front because you're adding in liquefaction and regasification within that processing portion. Uh, if you then add on transportation, um, there is um, 
obviously, again, a fairly large portion attributable to LNG, smaller portions to gas, uh, pipeline gas and to coal. Add in again that slippage portion and the, uh, the pipelines going across from Russia uh, to China suffer particularly on that front. Um, and then you add in combustion, and this is, of course, as is well known, where coal has particularly significant impact. But when you add in all of these factors together, in fact, you start to see, OK, well, on a comparative basis between uh, coal into China and uh, Thick pipeline gas into China, um, actually the coal comes out with a lower total associated emissions. Now, things of course get more complicated if you then consider the impact of carbon capture uh, on potential use of these fuels in uh, power generation. If you add in the carbon capture, in fact, you end up with a significantly different picture. So all of that light yellow gets taken away. Now, every example of this is going to be different. This is why it's important to have the detailed analysis uh, done at the commodity level. But we think it sort of helpfully demonstrates why this matters and why this is going to start to be included more and more, not just in analysis, but actually in the valuation of different approaches. Now, for crude, I, I, I called out the fact that it is complicated to, to, to say, well, what are the actual emissions associated with a given supply? Um, without even getting into refining and without getting into uh, the final burn, these are the broad categories that you could consider in an analysis of the carbon intensity of a given crude. Um, right from the, if you were doing absolute full life cycle, uh, of course, you have exploration uh, before anything else. Um, when we look at this, and we have started to build this out now across different crudes, we think that if the focus now is on the emissions associated with the particular crude, then in fact, exploration should not be included in that analysis because the current barrels being produced are not leading into that. They're also relatively small in terms of impact. Similarly, drilling and development um, also for now, something that we aren't in including in our analysis of what the carbon intensity is of a given crude. But if you think forward and you're thinking about, okay, there's going to be further drilling, further development that needs to be included in this carbon accounting, then it will need to be added in somehow at a future stage. Transportation. Um, we are looking at, but we want to ensure it's separated out. Why? Because, of course, if you're dealing with a global waterborne market, um, everyone's transportation picture is very different, and it needs to be a transportation-focused analysis rather than a particular crude oil-focused analysis. What we end up with, therefore, is a focus on production and extraction and surface processing. That alone, however, has well over 50 factors contributing to the intensity of a given crude. Um, and it's something that we are measuring. Particularly notable is the impact of flaring and venting. This is where we see a huge amount of variation between different crudes. What does that variation look like? Well, this is the, um, a snapshot of the beginnings of our analysis of certain key crudes. And you can see here, overall, there is a, um, uh, a correlation, an inverse correlation between density and carbon intensity. Um, and you'll also notice that there are some crudes that sort of sit outside of that line. So the, the big blue backen uh, and Kirkuk uh, on the top right hand side, these are crudes where we're seeing a larger than average amount of flaring. Um, and as a result, the carbon intensity is significantly higher. But this is the core group, as it were, not on this chart and indicated by the arrow there at the top is off on the far, far, far right, uh, some crudes where the impact is significantly higher and the emissions are significantly higher because of the associated venting that is happening there. All of this, of course, 
can therefore be included into not just an analysis to be able to say that's the carbon intensity, but into the actual value that comes out in the market. Now, one way of approaching that, and we've sort of charted that out here, is to say, okay, if you took the carbon price for just that upstream portion, um, what would be the price impact? And this is over the last few years taking Dubai um, as the example, um, and then using the upper Zakam, which is a constituent grade within the Dubai benchmark, um, as a the, for the for the carbon intensity, and then multiplying that carbon intensity by the European EUA price. There are a lot of different credit prices you could take, which we'll come back to carbon prices. Um, but taking that price over the last few years, not up to the recent uh, very, very high levels, but even at prices of around $20 per allowance, uh, you arrive at a differential and impact for close to $2 a barrel. That is the sort of level at which, in fact, crude flows around the world change. This is, of course, more or less the level that we see as the difference between Brent and Dubai uh, over time. Uh, and that is the price level that drives a lot of the flows between the West and the East in the crude markets. If this value were incorporated in and considering the variability that we just saw in the last chart, you can therefore start to see that it would impact what flows were fairly significantly. The price impact uh, is also, it's not a straight line because as we saw in the chart a couple of slides back, there are crudes that are very, very far along the carbon intensity curve. And in fact, if, if you plot out uh, the world's crude oil supply uh, using rough measures um, of carbon intensity, you and then you, you apply a, a different carbon prices uh, you get this chart here. This is a, a $10, $20, $30, and $40 a ton for carbon. Most of the world's crude falls into that $1 to $2 uh, per barrel impact. But there is a sharp discontinuity on the right-hand side of this chart where the impact starts to become more like $20, $30, $40 $10 a barrel, which is, of course, highly significant. Now, um, I mentioned, and I'm slightly aware of timing here, so I think I've got a few minutes left, um, and Valerie's not gesticulating at me yet to, to hurry up. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about that carbon element and the carbon price within it. Um, what we saw over the last year was when we saw trades uh, executed in this space, they had attached to them carbon credits, wherein the emissions were offset through these instruments. Now, carbon credits are very different from European emissions allowances. Allowances are more or less represent a permit to emit. Uh, and if you're going to be emitting and you're within the scheme, you need to produce them within the required time frame. Credits, on the other hand, are generated through specific projects around the world that have demonstrated either the, the avoidance or reduction of emissions or the removal of emissions from the atmosphere. They are uh, highly diverse. There's a lot of different types of credits out there, uh, whether through the issuing body, the body that has verified what has happened around it, or through the types of projects involved. Um, and you can see listed out on the left here, some of those different types of projects. The, the largest majority, the largest share over the last several years have come from renewables projects, wherein, uh, in effect, uh, they have um, replaced plans for fossil uh, fired generation um, with renewable generation, and that's generated credits. It has to demonstrate that it is, in fact, an additional project and not simply that the renewables projects were going to be uh, carried through already. Uh, that's also, incidentally, because we've seen a, a um, significant drop in the costs associated with renewables, that has meant that far fewer of those projects are now able to demonstrate additionality. You see much more focus increasingly on the broad nature-based solutions in this space, which includes um, both protection of forestry, but also 
uh, planting new forests, uh, and it also inclu includes land management, soil management, um, all these different areas. Um, and then you get into sort of a, a range of other types of projects, um, and all of them have a different value. It can be a somewhat confusing world. Um, the uh, airline industry, or rather the, the UN's um, International Civil Aviation Authority, uh, spent a significant amount of time over the last several years trying to arrive at what is considered good quality in this space. And they arrived at a program called Corsia, and Corsia is a voluntary mechanism for the next few years, but then becomes mandatory uh, after 2023. And what that has done is because um, they have outlined acceptable credits in that system, it created a fungible part of the market that was in many ways a lot easier to transact. Uh, we have seen growth there in transparency. And as a result, Platt started publishing a price for that segment of the market uh, at the beginning of January. Uh, this thing, the, the Platt CEC, which is the price for Corsia eligible credits. But it's a market in which there is a huge amount of change going on uh, quite rapidly at the moment. Um, and those nature-based credits are also now trading um, in significant volumes. As a result, on Monday, we launched a price for uh, nature-based credits, as well as for what are called the household um, credits as well, uh, which is where you've got things like um, household devices credits, where you've got things like cook stoves um, being installed um, it, as a replacement for um, charcoal, as a replacement for um, uh, simple fires, which therefore generates a reduction in um, emissions as well. The biggest question in this space for the um, oil industry and for the gas industry is what is going to be considered the acceptable credits if they are going to be incorporated into trades in this way. Um, we are expecting and starting to see some coalescence around that, but it is nascent and there is going to be an evolution of standards as we move forward. Um, last point on all this, which is just some of that information flow that we're starting to see on the carbon credit markets. And you can see here some snapshots from a couple of the exchanges uh, which have seen a certain amount of activity uh, over the last several months and beyond. Um, one is Expansive's CBL uh, platform, which you can see in the top there. Another is uh, Air Carbon Exchange out of Singapore on the bottom right. Um, but there's a huge amount of other information coming through as well. Um, and we're starting to put all that out. You can see on the left, some of the, the headlines from all of that. I think I've hit my time and I am going to stop there. Perfect timing, yes, don't worry. That was, that was fascinating. It's really interesting to hear all of these new, um, these new variables and factors being assessed and, uh, and trying to give shape to it in a, in, with, with a market-based approach, basically. So it's, it's really very interesting because you've talked about the policy signals a little bit from Europe, but what you're developing here is really just responding to demand from industry on, um, on sort of anticipating, I gather, anticipating maybe an audit of uh, full, full value chain emissions or liability. Um, is it coming from investors as well? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a whole other part of this I, I didn't really delve into, but the, the corporate claims are increasingly, um, as, as you say, you know, the impact statements um, and, it, it, and of course, you know, feeding into TCFD as well means that public companies are being measured and judged on their current approaches to emissions, but also on their plans for how they will be tackling it in the years ahead. Um, so we are seeing a significant growth, both in sort of the analysis of those plans and also really in terms of the sort of the, the, the comparative measures of them as well. So the chart I showed at the front, which is some of the announced 
uh, emissions reductions um, that some of the uh, international majors have put out there um, is something that we're, we're seeing from many companies um, in this space. Um, and we certainly are seeing that also reflected um, in the opinions of investors of those companies as well. Mm, interesting. Um, let's see, I think we have a, a question from Paul. Um, Paul, would you want to just ask your question if you have uh, your mic accessible? Hi, morning, everyone. Um, John T, morning. Well, good afternoon, sorry. <laughs> just a, a quick question, just, just for my understanding. Um, how are carbon monoxide emissions being taken into consideration in the whole scheme of, of carbon dioxide emissions? So, um, I, I mean, that's a very good question. And what I should have probably emphasized is that when we refer to sort of the carbon accounting, it's the impact of all greenhouse gas emissions within that. Uh, now, for some parts of this, the largest share is carbon dioxide. For some parts of it, the largest share is in fact uh, methane. Um, the approach that we're using is actually the, it, it starts with the model that was produced by Stanford University, uh, which is, actually open source uh, or the equivalent thereof. I can't remember the exact legal rubric, but you can go and look it up. It's called um, OPG, O-P-G-E-E, -E, and I can't remember what the acronym stands for. Um, and if you look at that though, you will see how they are, um, that, in, that initial analysis, and it is very much initial, actually breaks down every bit of the chain. So when I mentioned 50 factors earlier, um, it goes through um, all of those and, they have done some assignations of um, uh, particular greenhouse gases for each stage. Um, it, it's really helpful, but I would emphasize that um, we actually see that as much more dynamic because of course, a lot of these factors are changing over time, particularly flaring and venting, et cetera. So that needs to be taken into account. So I hope, I hope that answers your question. It's not a specific answer on exactly how carbon monoxide within all that uh, is included, but there are a lot of elements within that. Um, if you wanted a follow-up, we would be, I'd be very happy to put you in touch with our carbon accounting team uh, that is actually going through this on a field-by-field -field basis at the moment. Yeah, thanks for that. I was just wondering because um, looking at one of the slides when you, um, when you crossed out transportation, you know, just looking at the vessels traversing to and fro you know, and also the energy that is being utilized on the rigs itself, and even in the flaring process. I mean, carbon dioxide is produced from complete combustion, but sometimes there's also incomplete combustion because systems are not all, always running at 100% efficiency. So I was just trying to understand how that aspect of, of carbon is being taken into consideration. Yeah, and, and there's shares at each of those stages that are assigned in the initial analysis, uh, and then, um, but more in-depth measures that are sort of now being produced as people dig into the specifics for, for every part of production. Um, so, uh, I mean, as I say, I'd be very happy to kind of put you in touch with, with that team because they are actually looking to iterate all that as well um as we all sort of move closer to a measured outcome rather than a modeled outcome around all of this as well thanks for that John. um we have some questions from ahmed um ahmed do you want to um do you want to ask your yeah, questions or would you like me to do hi, it hi hi john t I, I really enjoyed your presentation uh this is ahmed uh, messi here um uh and i had a couple of questions. This is a really, it's a really strong area of interest that I'm uh, getting into recently, and I'm, I'm, I'm very, I very much applaud you getting into providing a bit more detail because, quite frankly, we lack transparency on this issue, and the methodological framework that we have is actually primarily from, uh, you know, from from this study that we had um, from uh, Stanford, uh, which was actually quite heavily funded by Aramco. Mm -hmm. And I know the guys who worked on it. And in fact, I, if you, I recommend everyone who's interested in this to actually go into the Excel models and look at the, uh, the methodology behind it, because 
without seeming too critical, a lot of it is out of date. The, the, a lot of it is based on data that is actually um, uh, you know, referring back to 2003, 2002. And actually, more importantly, there's a big gap that you know, we're not accounting for some processes along that chain, like uh, flare, uh, um, in terms of methane intensity. So when, when we refer to carbon intensity, I think the problem we have is that we're not accounting for venting and flaring and methane leakages, which in fact have a higher um, impact upon that. Uh, so, so, so there's one question around methodological um, origins of these studies. And second issue is going to be around a globe, you know, we may have a carbon price that may be, there may be arbitrages between carbon prices, for example, but if we do get, for example, to a fixed carbon price, who is actually going to set, um, you know, who, or rather, let me put this this way: How is it going to actually be uh, in, uh, integrated into the methodology for benchmarks um, that, for example, Platts provide? Whether that's, for example, Dubai and Dubai offset. You know, you talked about Dubai offset. Is that actually going to be? taking into account a, a European carbon uh, a methodology or a pricing methodology, or is it going to be plat setting it? Um, finally, just a technical question on that chart you had on the, uh, on the upstream carbon intensity for the field. I didn't really get some of that because why is Kirk Cook so high if most of the flaring and the, you know, the upstream in Iraq, for example, is in the south, where and you know, for example, Basra Heavy or you know, or the recently launched Basra Medium is not in that. Um, so just, I would like a bit more definition around carbon intensity, and then also on that chart you had on Dubai offset, Dubai versus offset Dubai. Okay, um, thank you, but, thanks, Ahmed. Um, I think your points on on uh, on methodology are, are are well taken, Dante. I don't want to get too much into the weeds of this, but I think the comments from Ahmed do, do sort of uh, bring to the fore some of the challenges of this market because it's a market driven approach. Obviously, it's not a regulatory approach, so there there may be this issue of arbitrage of different definitions. Um, and, of and, and if you could touch also on the issue of uh, the emissions intensity as measured, not including flaring and methane, I think that's quite um, uh, salient. Yeah, it, it, these are really important points you, you raise there, Ahmed. Um, so a couple of things. First of all, you, you're absolutely right. I think we view OPG as a great starting point, um, but certainly not as the end point. And this analysis that I showed here was um, very much building on that, but it was incorporating in flaring and venting on the basis of uh, satellite data. So, and in fact, that becomes a dynamic measure. Um, and as to why Basra is not on there, it's it's because this is a uh, a selection. We've 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 done some work in this space, but we haven't covered everything yet. And in actual fact, what we are doing now is going back to base principles and rebuilding all this from the bottom up so that we take all the most recent data, all the most recent information that we have for every crude that we produce this for and build up the carbon intensity factor that way rather than um, taking some of the sort of uh, rough is the wrong word because the OPG work is, is very detailed and it is excellent. Um, but it's, um, it's a different approach, essentially. So, so yes, flaring and venting, very important, very much included. Per the question around how benchmarks evolve in this space, I think it's always very dangerous to say what will be a benchmark in advance of that being the case. Uh, what I will say is that we certainly think that there is the need for pricing in this space. If you think back to my earlier slide on the comparison between whether the market takes an attribute approach or an offset approach, I, I sort of personally think they actually more or less collapse into each other because what, what is the differential that would arise from carbon intensity as a, uh, an attribute of a crude? That differential should be a, a price of carbon 
And per the point that you're mentioning there and that Valerie's reiterating around the potential arbitrage, there's potential arbitrage that is therefore going to arise, not just, for example, between EUAs and international carbon credits, but actually between all the different measures of carbon intensity and ways of reducing that across a full range of fuels. So you actually start to think about, okay, well, what's the carbon intensity of aluminium? And in an efficient market-driven world, uh, you should be looking for the cheapest way to reduce uh, emissions rather than having all these different measures. So yes, th there should be eventually some sort of uh, coalescence uh, across the different commodities. Um, whether that happens around EUAs, I'm sort of, you know, I'm uh, interested, but I'm not sure that that necessarily will be the final outcome. Um, I do personally um, think that something like credit instruments down the line will be a really key driver in all that. Uh, I'll stop there. I'm, I'm uh, really aware that I've sort of now spoken far too long and want to make sure to give space uh, to Guillaume and, and Michael um, because we've got more time for discussion at the end, I think, Valerie, isn't that right? Yes, exactly. But yes, but it's good to it's good to get some of these questions in now while it was it was that methodology is quite important in this sort of fluid uh, space. So um, absolutely. Yeah, it's really interesting. Okay, Guillaume, uh, let's I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on how this is all affecting investment um, and uh, uh, capital markets what they're thinking. So over to you. Thanks, uh, Valerie, for convening this meeting. We're uh very pleased to share some of the perspectives we've developed on carbon markets and how that's affecting uh, oil and gas production. Um, Mike here is training uh, carbon for VTOL, so uh, would, uh, could share also some perspectives on how we see uh, um, some of the, the points that uh, were just raised on how to arbitrage carbons across markets or products. Um, in this presentation, I will talk a little bit more on the other two points, which is um, uh, what does ESG slash carbon mean for, for production, right, for producers, and um, turning that uh, potential liability or cost into an opportunity as carbon markets develop, actually. So um, the way we've structured our uh, uh, discussion today is very simple. You know, the macro environment, I'm going to fly through that relatively quickly. Everybody is aware of what's going on. And then we'll delve into the funding of hydrocarbon production, because we're seeing the carbon markets starting to affect uh, the availability and cost of funds uh, to, uh, to, to support hydrocarbon developments. And then, and then what people can do or are doing already to address that and how they're turning uh, the carbon issue into a revenue stream actually in some geographies. So um, the macro, I mean, you're all familiar with this, hydrocarbons are responsible for uh, oil and gas. I mean, not, not called oil and gas for 42% of the global emissions. A third of global emissions is the combustion of, um, of oil and gas. And then production, uh, direct emissions is 8%. And then the indirect emissions, which is the carbon content of the services consumed by the oil and gas uh, industry is only 1%. So what producers really, uh, can focus on is, the, is this number eight because the the resource is what it is you know and and the services are much more difficult to decarbonize. Um, everybody has seen this kind of charts uh, on page three. This is the global emissions by greenhouse gas over time since the 70s, and you know the various scenarios people have uh, designed. So everybody says it has to come down, ideally down to zero by 2050. And depending on the speed at which we come down, the probability to exceed 1.5 degrees increases. You know, you would need a crash in emissions to actually meet the 1.5 degree uh, target. Anything above that increases the probability that we will exceed 1.5 degrees and reach two or two and a half. But okay, that's a little bit you know, the the meta story around uh, uh, emissions. Um, Two weeks ago now, uh, the IEA um, has published a report uh, on uh, net zero scenarios. Um, they produced a chart very similar to this one. I'm not going to go through that, but it says, well, to, to go down to net zero, we need to start reducing emissions 
significantly very fast. And the oil and gas production actually takes a hit immediately in that scenario. So they don't want um, no new oil and gas fields approved for development starting this year, right? Um, elimination of fossil boilers you know, in, a, in a few years. Um, the uh, fast acceleration of uh, the uptake of electric vehicles and so on and so on. And when you talk to producers, it is creating a little bit of anxiety, which is um, you know, totally natural. But from our standpoint, we say, well, you know, the likelihood we hit that scenario is relatively low, but you have to accommodate that carbon concern and you have to include that in your decision making. And the primary reason is about money. Um, the oil and gas sector has um, found it more difficult to attract capital. Uh, in the last few years. Um, the first one has been price uncertainty. Uh, we've come through a pretty high and a low and a high and a very low last year and a, and a fast recovery now. Um, you will see commentary in the press, including from us, that we expect the price to actually continue climbing uh, in the next uh, a few months just because uh, the sector has been underinvested and the demand is recovering very fast. Energy transition is, uh, is a concern. We see a lot of capital being uh, rerouted towards uh, greener projects at the expense of oil and gas, and we'll show some numbers. Social license to operate, um, as Platz was just uh, suggesting, you know, the transparency on emissions by type of resource is increasing. And you know, people will be answerable very soon uh, on the performance of their oil and gas uh, production cycles. And geopolitical risk—that's that's, that's a, a, a meta story about uh, people trying to invest locally, but usually renewable investments are local. And finally, capital stewardships is just that uh, we've seen the oil and gas companies struggling to uh, deploy capital efficiently. In the last two to three years, they have primarily focused on brownfield and not greenfield anymore. There is no mega project in the oil and gas industry these days. I mean, the capital deployment performance has been so poor that uh, I would say investors have been spooked. And uh, the, uh, I mean, most oil and gas companies have responded by increasing capital discipline and really focusing on brownfield expansions. Um, on the debt side, and that's much more relevant for national oil companies, um, the, the cost of capital is going up. Um, equity is less relevant for an NOC, but if they rely on debt, uh, we've seen the cost of debt going up very fast. And today we have a 30% premium for oil and gas capital over green renewable project capital. And um, the expectation that this premium is here to stay and possibly to grow even more. The other thing we've seen is that uh, the ability to raise debt uh, in reserve-based lending or uh, just corporate lending for, uh, for national companies as for a number of NOCs, not all of them, for a number of NOCs, um, it has become more difficult. An example here, um, we were involved in a capital raise for a billion dollar. Uh, initially, it was 1.7 billion, and that national company could only raise half of that. So beyond cost, there is an availability question. Liquidity is drying up on oil and gas. And the primary reason that the banks are actually uh, pushing forward is that there is a lack of clarity on the intensity of the ESG effort that uh, these producers can undertake or are willing to, uh, to undertake. And it wouldn't take much, by the way, to increase that liquidity. And that's going to be uh, some of the uh, points we want to develop here. Convincing lenders that you have an appropriate framework to deal with this issue and are starting to address it 
in our view, would actually unlock liquidity and bring you back to where we were three years ago. But it's, it's critical that people take that into account. Otherwise, capital will be much scarcer. Um, this is uh, just some Bloomberg numbers to show you oil and gas cost of capital versus renewables. So the red line is the cost of equity. And you can see um, it has been stable on oil and gas and it has jumped more recently after uh, you know, the COVID uh, situation. Whereas it has continued to decline for renewables with a, a small uptick recently, but much less steep than what we've seen in oil and gas. Cost of debt uh, has come down uh, on each side, just uh, you know, following the uh, interest rates globally trending down. But again, it has come down more uh, for renewables than it has for oil and gas. Or you could say, you know, when you're close to zero, it doesn't the, the potential for further reductions is, is limited. But um, the benefit has really accrued to uh, renewables uh, players. On this slide, what you see is the, um, uh, the volume of financing issued by uh, the major banks globally for fossil projects versus green projects. Um, so you see a trend of declining investments uh, in, in gray. Um, but more importantly, you see the growth in green. And um, this year, for the first time, more money has been directed towards renewables than towards uh, the fossil industry. And if you were to expand that chart to the second quarter, you would expect the uh, overtaking to have accelerated and uh, much more money has gone to renewables than to, uh, to fossil in the, last, uh, in the last six months. Primarily because you know, low oil prices up until just a few weeks ago uh, was a deterrent but there's a secular trend of more money flowing towards green. Now, the way to think about it is, is you know, in, in, our, uh, in, in this simple framework, say, okay, if you have ESG at the top, this is the over, overriding concern, and E being the primary letter. We hear very little about S and G, frankly, in the market. Um, net zero being the uh, leitmotif people people talk about. Um, it's all about redirecting money away from, uh, from oil and gas to, to renewables. So what this flight to quality, quote unquote, creates a scarcity premium uh, for oil and gas production and a liquidity issue. The way to address that today is relatively simple. It is to have a credible ESG program. And it doesn't have to be big. That's the main point. It doesn't have to be, you know, you, people are not expecting producers to reduce emissions by 50%, like the IOCs are promising. What they want to see is action. Um, I'm going to switch to this. I mean, the, because we're talking to, to producers and mostly national oil companies, when, when you look at the energy intensity of production, that's the, that uh, crude grade by crude grade and resource by resource. We just looked at um, here at that country level. Um, a lot of the emittive resources are located in countries where a large national company operates or even dominates the industry. Um, Algeria, because it's a very gassy province, um, has the highest emissions, you know, more flaring, more uh, energy consumption per barrel. Saudi Arabia, uh, at the very bottom, uh, seems to stand out, but it's primarily driven by the type of resource, frankly. Saudi is an oil province uh, with limited flaring. So, but if you scale up to production, obviously Saudi becomes uh, a very significant player on, on that stage. So these uh, NOCs have, if you want to, to, to put it this way, the carbon resource to address the problem. Instead of saying, well, we have a bigger problem, you also have a bigger opportunity to reduce emissions. When, when you do a breakdown of where these emissions are located along the value chain, um, 
plats to that by um, uh, upstream, midstream, and so on. We, we broke down that by the type of emission instead of the exact location. Um, you will see that uh, the actual, if you want a value chain action, which is extraction, refining, and so on, is only about a third of the emissions. Uh, two thirds, close to, is fugitive emissions. Uh, we saw that in this analysis of the gas going from Russia to, to China, mostly fugitive emissions from the pipeline system. And these emissions, some of them uh, are easy to fix and usually have very large greenhouse gas warming potential because it's methane being leaked to the atmosphere, which is 25 times worse on a 100-year uh, time horizon. Flaring, everybody talks about flaring. Yes, it's true for some regions, but it's not that large. Well, the biggest opportunity is fugitive emissions. The technologies are already available to address all of that, and some of them very cost effectively. And we'll show you just um, what people, you know, the discussion we're having with people say, okay, you know roughly the scale, you know where they are, so how do you think about sustainability in your production? What are the levers uh, you should pull? Um, the first one, lots of people talk about, but it's relatively small in terms of potential, is the energy efficiency lever. Uh, you know, most of that production is relatively energy efficient today. Um, a big part of it is the decarbonizing of the energy input, trying to put electricity, renewable power, wherever you can in the, in the production process. And then the biggest lever, as we discussed, is the uh, fugitive emissions, the decarbonization of the production process itself. Flaring, yes, large in some, in some sub-regions, uh, but uh, fugitive emissions is everywhere. Finally, uh, we talked briefly about that, is offsets. And here, this is a very large untapped potential in many producing countries. Um, Platts talks about that, uh, you know, trying to offset your own production and so on. Um, the co-benefits, developmental aspects, you know, uh, standard of living, uh, empowerment of women, all of that comes with this kind of projects at the same time. So from a development standpoint, you kill many, many birds with one stone. And these emission reductions are also from, in, in most instances, extremely inexpensive. So, okay, you know the levers, roughly their size, then see what's next. Well, the next dimension to think about is this vertical axis here. How soon can you capture these emissions? So one is size, second is speed. Offsets tend to be the fastest. You can put a project together in, uh, in six to 12 months. Um, decarbonizing energy inputs, so renewables, electrification, so on, is also a 12 to 18 month project. The rest becomes sometimes, you know, um, I would say a bit more, a wider spectrum in terms of speed. So from very fast to uh, relatively slow. So you're talking months to years, you know, uh, years at the bottom, months vertically. We wanted to put some examples, practical. So what does that mean? What do people do? I'll give you an example on the left. Um, typical in a gassy region, gassy province, where you produce a lot of gas, you have compressors spread out all over the system. Um, some, some countries like uh, Algeria will have in the order of a thousand turbines and compressors. Um, here you put this generator helper. So um, the gas turbine usually runs the compressor directly. You put an engine, electrical engine, fed by the grid or by renewable powers on site, which provides relief to the gas turbine and reduces emissions. What it can do also, which is interesting, is it can help the turbine run at the optimal efficiency level so that uh, when the compressor doesn't need as much power from the turbines, then the excess power is put through that helper and exported as power to the grid. So that's an example. Um, um, it, it's, it's being deployed now. The other one is the um, um, 
the flares. And when people talk about flares, they usually talk about eliminating, eliminating these flares. But about a third of the emissions from flaring comes from inefficient combustion at the flare tip, where you have a lot of slippage of methane. And just tuning these flares cuts emissions drastically at almost no cost. I mean, you're talking a few hundred thousand dollars uh, to save millions of tons a year you know, at each of these flares. So these are very easy interventions and, and producers can build these uh, abatement cost curves and realize that a very large potential, usually between zero and 40%, will be in the order of you know, less than $2 per ton to reduce emissions. And the last one on the right is outside of the production system, when you think about offsets in your own country, what can you do? So we've put some nature-based solutions around the protection of forest, red, grazing. Um, Pat's talked about cook stove and um, water wells, uh, solar uh, panels and lead lighting, or the reduction of gas leaks in the, in the distribution system. Typical CapEx for a relatively large proje uh, project and the unit cost of these offsets. And what you see, it's, you, you can find lots of offsets below $5 and a very large potential uh, at, at a one to $3. The, uh, when, when you see these kind of things, you know, a, a sub-Saharan African country will find millions and millions of tons of offsets. Uh, with co-benefits in terms of uh, uh, social development goals at less than $2. What's missing today, and that's a message that we want everybody to take to the COP26 in London or in, in Scotland in, uh, in a few months, it's easy to produce offset. It's not as that easy to find buyers. And the best thing people can do in November in Scotland is to request buyers to come to Africa and buy offsets. That's the first commitment. And the second commitment is to not loot the producers of these offsets. It's too easy to buy an offset for $2 and sell it for $30 in Europe or in Korea or in the US. I think once the Article 6 under the Paris Agreement is negotiated, we will have much fairer trading and you'll see these offset values going to their actual marginal value in use, which will be more 20 or $30 a ton, creating a very large revenue potential for some of these countries. Now, the, the capital to actually develop these projects can come from many sources. Um, we are, as Vital, involved with a number of NOCs actually on the debt side. And we're suggesting to redirect a portion of that debt towards carbon projects. Sovereign wealth funds are starting to invest as well. Uh, so we're working with a handful of them on this type of projects. And then private equity or traders like us um, will also put capital. So there is no shortage of investment capital to tackle emissions across the board, you know, inside the production systems of national companies or outside in offset programs. So I'm gonna stop here for a second. Just, I mean, the, the, the conclusion now at, at that stage is the ESG pressure is there. Uh, it is absolutely inevitable. Everybody is affected. Transparency will increase. Nobody will be able to hide. Um, access to capital and the cost of capital will be differentiated on ESG performance. It's coming today. It's cost and liquidity, but that spread will just increase and liquidity will really dry up for the producers who totally ignore uh, the question. National oil companies have a large set of opportunities inside their system and inside their countries, and the capital is available. So it's all about actually putting these pieces together and um, getting to work, frankly, because it's a very exciting opportunities. And I'm going to pause Thanks. now. Thanks, Guillaume. That was super interesting. Um, 
a lot of uh, it triggered both of these presentations triggered a lot of questions from uh, from me but I I will defer to the uh, participants if they have any questions they should just uh, raise their hand uh, with the reaction button or put their questions in the chat um, I want to just uh, start us off by um, just challenging a little bit this idea of the uh, forest or nature-based offsets um, the 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 volume of offsets that would be required to to really um, offset what amounts to 42 percent of global emissions from the oil and gas industry is not feasible um, so there's there's too much there are too many emissions to offset with nature-based solutions um, I was reading that uh, just two companies, ENI and International Airlines Group, would exhaust 12% of available total offsets through force, just those two companies. Um, so so how do we find the balance uh, in, what, in the offsets uh, strategy? The, the, the offset market is relatively small huh, today. It's, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Platts put the number at 100 million tons, you know, let's say 150 million tons max in 2021. Um, the objective of most market participants is to grow this volume by at least 10 times in the next five years. Um, so you're getting to two to three gigatons. So it becomes material, right? Um, that's one. Second, um, if you have 10% of, let's say, to just to round things up, of global emissions linked to the production of hydrocarbons, and half of that is fugitive emissions, it's relatively easy to, you know, that through fugitive emission reduction to abate another two gigatons. So the levers at the disposal of uh, national oil companies are actually probably the largest you can access, frankly. Mm -hmm. That's not going to save hydrocarbons in the long run, but yeah. that's going to extend their life. Yeah, and I would just add to that, I think that that's the point. The idea is not that you can, uh, how should I say, uh, wash your conscience or get out of uh, dodge just because you're doing nature-based solutions or offset projects, but the idea is that it should form part of the strategy. So as, as Guillaume's saying, if you don't touch anything to do with your own facilities and you only look to buy, so let's say for argument's sake, you're West African or oil producer X, and you say, I've gone completely carbon neutral because I did a deal with Brazil and I've bought up half of the Amazon uh, rainforest in a bay. That's not going to work with the banks. The banks are not going to accept that. It will just look, even if it's not greenwashing, the first thing that will be said is you're greenwashing. So I think the, the objective for the NOCs should be, look, you have to do things which are practical and linked directly with your sources of production. But I think the point that Guillaume is making is you can also add to that with nature-based solutions, which the banks and financial institutions are very interested in. And on top of it, you also have these, you also help the sustainable development goals. So you can also have a lot of benefits in country in terms of linking your activity for oil and gas production with what you're doing both with your own facilities, but also within country to help uh, and help development within country. Mm -hmm. Janti, did you want to come in on the offsets? It, well, I mean, a couple of things I'd add. One is, you know, how does any market balance? It's through the price, eh? And if we did see that explosion in demand or in trade that Guillaume mentions there, then obviously you would expect a far higher price. And and then, of course, you know, the market balances out as a result. Um, I mean, it's 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 one indicator, but the back end of the CME curve at the moment is, is more like $10 a tonne compared to sort of the front end being at $2, which is a, a significant um spread uh it's it's a curve it's not a, a forecast um but at those much higher prices as guillaume's pointed out there's a significant amount of um uh, abatement measures that can be taken that will be very cost effective in comparison and i think that's really what it's important to think of the carbon element there as that's the driving price that's how you value these things in the absence of an inherent va value visible in the oil chain itself. Um, now it may well be, as I kind of talked through, that actually we see that value coming through differentiated crudes, um, in which case you see it there. Uh, but the easy way to see it now is through that carbon price, uh, which I think, you know, Guillaume talked, talked through on that front very clearly. Thanks. 
I guess uh, maybe uh, thinking from the perspective of the governments that are uh, in our group, um, they don't have NOCs that are operators. Uh, so they may have NOCs that are minority shareholders. And so their leverage on you know, the emissions intensity or the ESG profile of a, of a project may be limited, though they do have some, some leverage um, as partners. I guess, you know, for what, what, what should the governments be doing? Um, if, they have, if they have an NOC, they could direct it to deliver an ASG plan. Um, but then for those that don't have an NOC, uh, should they be rethinking their licensing criteria to, to weed out companies that aren't going to be delivered, delivering credibly on emissions reduction and ESG? Well, the first thing governments can do is enact regulations that are supporting of, uh, you know, uh, um, better control of emissions and, and enforce these regulations. Very often we've seen regulations, but for various reasons, not uh, strictly enforced. That's one, you, you know, the, through the regulatory arm, um, there's a, quite a long reach. Um, the second is, um, is a support investment in carbon projects in their country. Right, and that's going that's going to be through the COP26 discussions on how people can trade these emissions, how much of that they let be export versus you know uh, consumed for their own national commitments, all of that. So it's not just the national or company that can act; it is actually you know the I would say the regalian function of governments uh, through um, the COP26 and internal regulations. And finally, I, I come back to that is to create a voice of, you know, uh, of, uh, at the COP26, because right now these offset discussions are left between, you know, you know um, let's say, well-intended NGOs, but that do not really think of Africa or Southeast Asia and so on, um, uh, that, you know, in terms of, sorry, using carbon as a development instrument is totally neglected by these NGOs, right? We are in the the realm of purity and how to do carbon accounting and then double counting and so on. Whereas I think the resource is in developing countries. This is where emission reductions can be cut the cheapest. And exporting these reductions to the countries that are willing to pay more is the new resource for these countries. And this is where these countries need really to have a stronger voice in these forums to make these markets happen because they will benefit from them greatly. And it's unfair today to get a carbon emission reduction and pay $2 in Tanzania or in Uganda and to sell it for $30 in a developing country that I'm not going to name um, because there is a bridge to do that. I think they should be selling at $28, right? And for that money to stay in country. So this is the new resource, carbon for these countries. Yeah, that's... Um, or that's negative really, carbon. Yeah, good point. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to come back to one of the, one of the figures that you gave, John T, on um, if, um, if an LNG pri or a, a, a gas for export uh, versus a gas for domestic use results in 11% higher emissions, um, that's obviously in a case where you would have infrastructure ready in the country where the gas is produced or extracted to, to be able to transport it and use it domestically. Um, a lot of emerging producers have, are in a situation where there's a disincentive for investment in gas because they don't have that infrastructure to capture, transport, and process, and, and market the gas domestically. And that means the project would have higher intensity. Um, I guess tying that into Guillaume's call for, for you know, rethinking development around um, reducing emissions and creating development, uh, positive development outcomes in, in the global south. What, what can we say about this? What, what do you think, uh, we, what would you say to our emerging gas producers? 
I, I mean, I, I, I think that comes down to how do you establish the value there that is going to allow you to make the investment? So how do you monetize the negative emissions you're trying to produce, as it were? Um, and, you know, I think it's it, it, there's, there's two paths. There's the do you do something now in the expectation that the crude will become differentiated as a result? Um, and I, I strongly believe that's going to happen, but it's, you know, it's very difficult to kind of point to that with certainty now um, because it's, you know, we haven't seen that actually become the full overlay uh, in the crude markets. We've seen sort of pockets of it. Um, and then the other route, of course, is to actually use that to generate credits uh, and actually go through the process uh, of actually demonstrating the uh, avoided emissions, working with one of the the, the standards, the, the entities that do credit issuance, um, and therefore being able to monetize that. Now, it, that is very similar in a sort of a more global sense to what we're expecting to see in the domestic gas market in the US, where we sort of see this sort of nascent performance uh, certificate market um, and where the, the, the demonstration that you have reduced fugitive emissions uh, leads into a, a an instrument that you can trade and gives you value for doing that. Thanks. Guillaume or Michael, do you want to come in on this question? Well, one comment. The, the carbon market is not a market. It's extremely fragmented. And the value of carbon really depends on where you can place that negative emission. Um, so it's worth $5, you know, as we saw, $10 maybe in the voluntary market. It's worth $55 in the EU allowance market. It's worth 400 euros a ton in the EU liquid fuel pool that, are part, that is partly accessible through the German market. So the, all of that, I think the fragmentation of the carbon market will remain. There's lots of opportunities that producers can think of to monetize that carbon in the best pool possible. And we've seen projects in upstream production, right, eligible under German regulations, um, that have achieved more than 400 uh, euros a ton. So um, these pockets of value are already accessible, and we expect more of that to, to be regulated and, and, and to open up. So it's, it's, I think it's, it's exciting because just as soon as you include that resource in your thinking on how you develop your hydrocarbons, you'll see lots of value streams. Um, and to, to comment on John T's point, yes, we haven't seen a real premium yet on uh, offsetted hydrocarbons. Lots of talk, not yet, but it's going to come. So you need to think about it. It doesn't cost much if it costs you $2 a ton to, to generate these credits and attach that to your hydrocarbons. You will kill so many birds with one stone and you'll be long, as we say in trading, a resource that will go up in value. So it's the right time to jump in. Yeah, I think I think the only thing, so obviously Keo and I have relatively shared opinions as we talk about this all the time, but I think the only thing I would add to it is exactly that, that it's it's not yet a market. That's the point. And it is, as Gil was saying, super fragmented. The price differentiations are huge. But if you just look at how things have evolved between now and six months ago, now and 12 months ago, now and two years ago, you know, we really are an accelerating curve and i think that that's ultimately the point i think that very often this is seen as a burden this is seen as an imposition something to be afraid of i think our message to the nocs is this is an opportunity to be grasped you have potentially the lowest cost of production of carbon offsets which as of today are looking for the market that's best for them to go into but that will all start sorting itself out over the next 6 12 24 months we saw what happened with the g7 last week all the trends are pointing in the same direction. All the major trading blocks are pointing in the same direction. So our recommendation, our thought is, even in the absence of a very clear forward curve or transparency in terms of pricing now, as with all markets, if you have the lowest cost of production of the commodity that's going to be required, you should look at developing it. One, one question I have is, is for, for a government that doesn't have an NOC, um, it's not going to be the one uh, applying for the carbon offset for an upstream project, correct? The company will, the presumably the IOC or it, with its NOC as a minority partner. So 
if the oil company commits to carbon offsets to for, for the project, would the cost of that be cost recoverable and come at the expense of the government's share of revenues? Good question. Probably. Uh, I, I mean, there's a number of costs that fall under the license to operate that are cost recoverable and some are not. So you'd have to make the distinction and, and make choices here. Um, the likelihood that you'll be able to find a market for it and recover that cost in the marketplace is almost 100%, as long as you're on the low cost side of the cost curve. So let's say you impose that and it costs two, three dollars. Yes, you will find a way to recover that. Absolutely no doubt. Um, as, a, as a country, as a regulator, uh, should you take that risk today? I would say yes, take it. it. It's a gamble on the carbon price globally and on positioning yourself to be a large producer of these carbon offsets through um, the license holders in your country. It should be a relatively easy way to get in. The advantage also is you let the license holders to choose the best way to meet that obligation, right? So they will actually select the most productive projects, whether it is in the production system or in offsets. They will bring capital for that, right? Uh, and they will be probably the ones also helping monetize these offsets, either by attaching them to the hydrocarbons or separately. It's probably a smart move at no cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to well, I was just going to, I mean, I think Guillaume's point earlier as well around this is a national resource. It's really important to emphasize in that context. And it's a national resource, particularly as a result of Paris. Eh? So, you know, national mandates mean that that becomes the sort of the negative achievement below that is a national resource. And, you know, I mean, none of us are lawyers, um, but... <laughs> I'm sure that's not envisaged under the original license agreement as to how that gets treated. So and I'm certainly not going to give any legal advice on that front, um, but it, it's clearly a novel asset in comparison to initially envisaged contracts. It is, it's interesting just how quickly all of this is moving. Um, and I know that in some of the comments uh, that you made with, to me before this, uh, this call that uh, one of you had said that two years ago, you know, this this wasn't uh, this wasn't material yet, and it and it's really been developed, you know, evolving so quickly. So I think you know some of what you've highlighted is um, that that fluidity and that we don't know, you know, that there's a, a sort of a, not a one market for carbon offsets, but many, um, and there's no carbon price, there's no standard. Uh, for emissions uh, uh, accounting or reporting. Um, if you look forward, where would you like, where, what kind of certainty or standard or you know, internationally recognized practice would you like to see that would really kind of unblock a lot of the investment and the practice that needs to change? But I'll just make one comment. Yes, mm -hmm. there is none, but they're coming. So mm -hmm. we had discussions with the city of London, for instance, say, what is the best way to support the carbon market? Well, is to agree on carbon accounting rules and make every company listed in London obliged to follow these rules. Overnight, you'll see Paris, Amsterdam, everybody will fall behind. And in, you know, in over 12 months, the rules will be agreed, it will become transparent, and that market will just explode. So we're, we're very, very close to that. People are thinking hard, it's coming. So I think on the resource side, start developing the resource because, because it will happen. And there's flexibility in the standard you use today, and you will be able to change standards in the future. You know, you're not locked into a system. Once the system has defined rules, you'll make sure that what you do follows the rules. But don't wait. That's, that's a message. And the cost of waiting is high, and the cost of doing something is low. So 
when you say when you say developing the resource, do you mean the carbon offset? Together project? with your hydrocarbons. Okay. Join, yeah. de develop them together. And it just, mm -hmm. de de well, they can be developed independently, by the way. But we would advise don't develop hydrocarbons without developing carbon. If you don't have much hydrocarbon, <laughs> still do, do carbon because it's there as well, sitting next to, uh, to the resource underground. Thanks. It, just, just on this point around standards, uh, I mean, as Guillaume says, it's coming. Um, I mean, I think, you know, obviously you have work at the level of sort of carbon disclosure project, uh, which is working hard to sort of have standards around those. Um, I think because we will see proposals written into law out of the EU around some commodities, that helps with the standardization work. Um, I think also because we see, as we see values attached to that carbon accounting, that's already generated the question around well, what really are you paying for? Um, you know, and, and the market itself is pushing very hard for that standardization. Um, there are companies providing carbon accounting services, the verification, uh, and then there are, uh, you know, several, I mean, we've seen the announcements, for example, from uh, Intertech being involved in the London crude sale where they provided that verification. So the more that you have the verifiers and that that's audited, that in itself is setting up the standards for what's included. But I think a really important point around all that as well is that we've seen very rapidly a move from uh, self-reporting as being viewed as really not sufficient, not credible, uh, the kind of we're now into the sort of modeled approach and we will go to the sort of full actual measured approach. Um, and, you know, as that happens, the question is going to be maybe which standard are you using? Sure. But it's also going to be what are you actually reporting? Which bits of this get reported out and therefore fully known? Um, and you may know different bits of it, you know, both, are, are, you know, myself and Guillaume went through how you can cut this differently, different, different elements of it. Knowing that is really the important thing is being able to say, look, this is where we've shown uh, all the upstream elements. Uh, and the standards themselves are going to very, very quickly arrive around that. Thanks. Michael, do you want to have the last word? Yeah, the only thing I was going to add to, again, what Guillaume said is I think, you know, whether it's the City of London, uh, you know, the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, Tokyo, as soon as these people come out with the account, you know, what they will deem to be acceptable in terms of accounting, as Guillaume said, there will be a rush uh, towards that. And I think something that came up earlier is not just on, let's call it the voluntary side. So, um, you know, exchanges for equities, debt, uh, et cetera, is on the regulatory side in the big areas that need to purchase these. So the carbon border adjustment mechanism that was referred to earlier, if the EU turned around and said, actually, we will allow you if you're importing from countries A, B, C, D, and E, if there are credits that you can generate to this standard within those countries, we will allow you. And then all of a sudden, you then have an arbitrage between the cost of production in country versus the cost of the EUA. And all of a sudden, this two to three to five to six dollar market is being benchmarked effectively against a 50 euro market. And this is the kind of, this is what we're going to see happening. So not necessarily this, the, the common border adjustment mechanism, but all of these things are being percolated within Europe, the US, China, other areas, Japan, South Korea. And this will start feeding into a, a fungible market and a tradable commoditized market where you will be able to have transparency on the price and therefore make the investment with confidence, and again, this is, I think, the message from John T. Guillaume and myself, is this is a natural resource that the countries listening to this uh, presentation should be able to generate and mine or drill for themselves, if you want to use that analogy. Thanks very much, Michael. Well, with this, I, I think we'll we'll bring the this uh, seminar to a close. I, I, I want to thank you so much. This was extremely insightful, uh, innovative, uh, a new new thinking it was really fascinating to me, and I know for for the rest of the group as well. Um, and this is really the 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 perfect kind of seminar for our forging a new path series because it's focused on how um, 
you know, evolving energy systems and carbon, uh, carbon uh, pricing and markets, how the new producers group countries can position themselves smartly within this change so that they're more resilient to it and, and well positioned to take advantage rather than be locked in to systems that were developed for another era. Uh, it's also, this seminar is also a precursor to the training that we're going to be uh, delivering in two weeks um, that uh, works with um, five governments on how to better align their climate, energy planning, and petroleum sector goals. Um, and so I think this was a, a perfect uh, introductory material for, for the course. So I want to thank you all very much. Oh, and just to mention that uh, on the 23rd of June, we'll have our next seminar, which will be looking at the IEA net zero to 2050 report. And what does it mean for emerging producers, especially in light of the comments made on uh, new exploration? Um, so I want to thank you all for joining and thanks so much to our speakers. It was a really fascinating discussion.